here in Bochum today, which is pretty much in the center of the Ruhrgebiet, the Ruhr metropolitan area, a region with more than five million inhabitants. And of course, you cannot look at the region from above right now, but you probably trust me that it looks nothing like this picture anymore. This one, I mean. <laughs> Even though the Ruhr area has its name from the River Ruhr, flowing right through it is not the Ruhr, but the River Emscher. And you see, back then, the Emscher was a slow-flowing river meandering through a landscape with only very few houses, mills, and farms. Nothing more. And by the way, back then, the Emscher was full of fish, really big fish even. But then, in the middle of the 19th century, coal was discovered in the area, and coal production started, going along with steel production, industrialization, and urbanization and nothing was as before. Within only half a century, coal production increased almost 20-fold, while the population growth that went along with the need for workers increased even more. You can imagine a lot of wastewater emerged from the coal mining activities, from industry and from the housing, and it all went directly into the Emscher without any treatment. Because back then, it was not possible to construct an underground sewage system. The reason were subsidences, which is the sinking of the ground surface due to underground mining activities. Can you believe, in some districts here in the Ruhr area, the, the surface is now 30 meters lower than it used to be before the mining started? So you can imagine, underground concrete channels would have broken frequently. The result you see here, as the Emscher was naturally spreading into its floodplains during rain, now with contaminated water, the result was long-lasting flooding and the spreading of diseases like cholera and typhus. So, what to do? The Emscher cities decided to join forces. They founded the Cooperative Water Board Emscher Genossenschaft and they developed a solution together. For this solution, the river Emscher was given a new face as a technical river, with a concrete bed and dikes left and right to keep the contaminated water under control. The same was done for the Emscher's tributaries. These are all the small streams and creeks in the entire region. The sole purpose of this technical Emscher system was to transport all the wastewater out of the Ruhr area and to impede further flooding. This technical Emscher system was an unattractive but very efficient system of open wastewaterways, and it stayed like that for over a century. The people in the region, they even had a nickname for these open sewers. They called them the Köttelbecke, which means as much as Droppings Creek. But in fact, those were areas that people avoided to go to because they were terribly smelly and also extremely dangerous. Due to the steep slopes and the high flow velocity and nothing to get hold on if you fell into it. Several people died that way. And also ecologically, the river was dead. You can imagine, the big fish were gone, and so were the small fish, and even aquatic insects and crustaceans. Only a few very robust worms could still be found. And diverse plants along the shores, well, you see in the picture, nothing. But then, in 1990, Mining slowly came to an end, which was a tragedy, of course, for the people in the region, especially work-wise. But on the other hand, it was also a chance to start over again. New jobs and a new identity had to be found, a still ongoing task. With the end of mining, also the subsidences slowly came to an end, 
finally allowing the construction of an underground sewage system. Because now, co underground concrete channels could not collapse anymore. So this finally was the chance to separate again the wastewater from the river water. So now, in a three decades long and five million euro project, sorry, five billion euro project, the so-called Emscher reconstruction was initiated and also conducted by the Emscher Genossenschaft. For that, four big wastewater treatment plants were constructed, as well as 400 kilometers of underground sewers, bringing the wastewater underground. Then, above ground, the restored, um, the now wastewater-free streams could finally be restored to near-natural streams. So the former open sewers are now turned back into near-natural waterways. And I'm saying near-natural here because time cannot simply be turned back, not even with 5 billion euro. Because oftentimes, the amateur just doesn't have enough space anymore to move freely. You see in the picture, the Emscher is trapped in between roads, railroads, the shipping channels, and houses. All this restricts the Emscher restoration. But by restoring the Emscher and its tributaries, even only to the degree possible, an immense change could be made and a structural change in the entire region could be initiated. For example, this steel plant, dusty, smelly, and ecologically dead, is now a place that nature took over again. It is a place that people come to, to recreate in nature and near the water. They are and surrounded by the industrial heritage elements. And this is a very popular place, only one of many. And did you know Spending time near the water and in nature even has a stress-releasing effect. Just try it out. And not only the people returned to the water, but also biodiversity did. Several or many plants and animal species in the river and along its shores. And uh, even some fish have returned now such as the so-called Emscher bullhead you see in the upper picture. For me, as a biologist, it is very impressive to see. And I can tell you how important biodiversity is for our ecosystems. Firstly, aquatic insects, like this caddisfly larvae that you see on the bottom, they are an important part of the food chain, feeding fish and birds, for example. Secondly, a lot of our terrestrial insects, like this dragonfly in the upper picture, they spend their childhood in the water. And you all know about the currently ongoing dramatic loss of insects that we are observing in Germany, but also worldwide. To stop this loss of species, we rely on clean and ecologically intact rivers. And thirdly, these aquatic insects and also crustaceans and worms they provide the rivers with a self-cleaning capacity because they feed on organic material and thus degrade it. All these are so-called ecosystem services of the rivers and the ecosystems. And there are even more services that we, as researchers, but also the society, can benefit from. For example, researchers can closely observe and monitor the ecological development. And so can the people in the region. Especially for children, this is a great benefit to be able to experience, understand, and learn about nature. And this just outside their doors. And bikers, they can enjoy new passes along the restored streams. And importantly, Restored floodplains serve as natural flood retention areas, holding back water and thus avoiding floods further downstream, for example, in industrial or housing areas, and consequently avoiding damages. So you see, the river restoration 
also has social and economic benefits. However, new challenges are constantly arising and we need to adapt to those new requirements as we did in the past. However, this time we want to and we need to do it with nature, not against it. Maybe the biggest of all challenges is climate change. And it goes along with the ongoing sealing of surfaces in our cities. Can you believe in the Ruhr area, 40% of the area is sealed by roads or buildings. The result is urban flooding during rain and fallen dry streams during drought. But there is a solution to these two challenges. And that is one solution. This one solution is that we need to have more green areas in our cities as they serve as sponges, holding back water during rain and then releasing it slowly afterwards. And in addition, those green areas, they capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and they cool the air on hot summer days. For this, we need to join forces again. And with we, I mean the cities and the people. A start has been made with an initiative that is called Water in the City of Tomorrow. A um, that's a collaboration between all the Emscher cities. But also, all of us here, we can contribute, for example, by turning our private entrance passes into green areas. Universities and companies can do the same with their open areas outside. Just make them soak up water. And there's even more, where we as individuals can become active. I just talked about water quantity, now to water quality. You have probably all seen such pictures. Plastics and microplastics in the rivers, in the environment. The same is true for chemicals and pharmaceuticals, just not visible. If, for example, we flush pills down the toilet, a part of the ingredients can pass the wastewater treatment plant and the treated water that is released back into the river may still contain these substances. Similarly, the thousands of chemicals that are used every day can partly end up in the rivers. And there, this cocktail of substances can harm the aquatic organisms by putting toxic stress on them, which reduces their growth and also their reproduction success. Me and my colleagues, we are currently working on assessing how much our Emscher ecosystems can actually tolerate. So we all have to keep such products out of the water. We need to dispose chemicals, plastics and pharmaceuticals in a proper way and we need to use them in much lower amounts. We all have our actions um, that impact the surrounding environment and we need to keep this impact as low as possible. We really hope that what we are doing here with the Emscher can inspire and also motivate other riverside communities worldwide because we have shown here that at the Emscher an immense change is possible if we work with nature. Thank you.